All right, we're back on sports, man. As you can see, I'm not in a good mood because of the things that we are going to have to talk about today. And yes, I'm talking about the comments that Mark Cuban made. I will save that for a couple minutes from now, and I know I'm going to talk about it. So anyways, I want, to, I want to start off with the Philadelphia Phillies and the no-hitter because there have been a lot of fans who have been outraged and enra enraged by the no-hitter. And I'm not understanding why. I understand that, you know, these guys are getting paid a lot of money. You look at these contracts on the Phillies, and it's like, yeah, somebody has to be able to get at least one hit. Somebody, all right? But it didn't happen. So I can understand why fans are upset about that, okay? However, you can't take away what Beckett did out there. You can't. And, that, and that's what it comes down to. So when it happened, Philly fans were upset. What did I say on Twitter? Congratulations. You know, I seriously. And the thing is, Dodgers fans couldn't even watch the game because for those that messaged me on Twitter, you were saying that DirecTV had the game blacked out. So you couldn't even see the no-hitter. How does the home teams, you know, I won't say the home teams fans because they were playing here, but, you know, a team like the Dodgers are getting ready to make history with a no-hitter and their entire, you know, their fan base in L.A. can't see it. That's crazy. But here's the part that bothers me about the no-hitter. Dodgers fans, your player, Ellis, all right? I'll put the link in the info bar gets injured during the celebration of the no-hitter. That's right. We're talking about a guy who wasn't even playing in the game, okay? He wasn't even playing, and he gets hurt celebrating. How, how is this possible? Like, from what I hear, this guy was just injured not too long ago. He came back, all right? Now he's injured again because there's a sprained ankle, and he's on the 15-day DL. Are these guys not taking care of themselves? What is going on with these celebrations that guys are getting freak accidents? You know what? You notice we've always seen freak injuries in baseball, and none of them make sense? None of them. Like I said, this comes down to a point where these baseball players, and, and I've said it before on camera, they are the laziest athletes I've ever seen. They are the laziest. It's, it's bad enough that you don't all of, us, all of you don't play offense and defense, all right? It's not like you're out there really running hard. You're sitting around and waiting. A lot of you sit in the dugout and wait. It's ridiculous. You got pitchers that hang their stomach are hanging over their belts, throwing, you know, but they can throw a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. It doesn't matter. You're not in shape. What happens if you got to actually run? What happened last night? Jimmy Rollins cut off a ball, right? Double bounce ball, turned, jumped, threw the ball in the air to try to get the first. The ball sailed. It wasn't even a hard throw. And he still got the guy. Are you tell me that guy couldn't run 90 feet before that? It just doesn't make sense, man. It also happened uh, last night when they cut off one at third base. And the guy had to actually stop it and turn and threw, and it was a bad throw. And he still got the guy out at first. There is no way. It's humanly possible, unless you're very unathletic, to not beat a ball that's not thrown hard and run 90 feet. You can't run the first base? What's the problem? And I'm thinking that it's getting to a point where these guys are making so much money they don't either care or a lot of guys are putting on a lot of weight. And what I mean, like, they're trying to, you know, hit the long ball, so they're putting on weight to get, you know, more muscle, but they're not running. So they're slow with that extra weight on them. And that's the problem. None of this makes any sense. But some of these guys don't even have an excuse. Some of these guys are only, like, 190. There's no excuse that you cannot run 90 feet when a guy is clearly not throwing the ball that accurately. There's no excuse. I don't understand this. Anyways, I want to move on to basketball. At least I just want to get this over with. For those who know, I did not want to talk about this Mark Cuban thing. You know, we saw what he said in the interview last week, and I was like, I really don't want to talk about it. I think we've done enough with the Donald Sterling thing for now until something happens. But then last night on TNT, for those who don't know, Mark Cuban had an interview with the guys, Chuck, Kenny, you know, uh, was it Shaq and, and, and Ernie on TNT about his, you know, his opinions on what he was saying about, you know, bigotry and, and prejudice and things of that nature, you know, in his interview. And what did I say on Twitter? Because last night when it was all over, uh, there was a lot of people on Twitter talking, you know, basketball. And I was like, so, you know, you know, before the game started, OKC San Antonio game, which is rigged. Don't get me started on that. But I had said, you know, what? Nobody has a problem with Mark Cuban's flip flopping in this interview. Nobody. And no, it was like everyone was okay with it. So I'm like, okay, whatever, you know. So I, I took it upon myself to say I'm going to talk about it today. So let's get started with this. I'm going to try to do this part by part, all right, and show you just how bad these interviews went. So let's just get into it. Well, Mark, obviously you've been in the news a lot lately, and I got to tell you something, man. Uh, you know, we, first of all, you know we're friends, obviously. So I'm a yep. little biased. But I don't think you have anything to apologize for. I know people have tried to misconstrue your words uh, and not listen to the entire interview. 
And I just want to say for myself, and I don't want to speak for myself, I don't speak for Shaq, Kenny, or Ernie, you have nothing to apologize for, man. Mark, uh, this is Shaq. Yeah, I, I, in fact, guys, as we, as we go down that road, I, it's, uh, it would be beneficial, I think, for everybody as we have this discussion if we could, we're going to play about a four-minute clip. Uh, Mark, your, I appreciate that, your, your interview with, uh, with Inc. Magazine. And so we'll play Thank this, you. and then we'll come out and we'll, and we'll roundtable it. You know, every time I hear Charles Barkley speak, the less I respect him. But at this point, I don't think there's much less to respect about him. You're already saying that you're friends with him. And you're biased. So guess what? There's no point of you talking. You understand that, right? Because you're not using overall perspective. You're friends with him. So there's no point at all because you're enabling him. You're telling him that he doesn't have to apologize. Look, I put it like this. We talked about in the comments how, you know, you can tell somebody's apology is sincere or not. And when Mark Cuban said that he didn't need to apologize for his statements and he's going to stand by them, okay, he wants to, that's fine. But you should know by now, if you're wrong, you apologize. This is what arrogance comes to, all right? And it's not about you all the time. It's about doing the right thing for other people. And it seems like for him to say, you don't have to apologize. Look, like you said, you do not speak for everyone. You are speaking for yourself. But when you are on TV and you are making statements like that, it makes you look bad. And it also hurts the people that you are contracted with. Because I'll put it like this. If you thought Charles Barkley was bad... I had to turn off the interview after uh, once Shaq started talking because he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, and I turned it off because it was it, it got disgusting to a point. Like the, the like the backside kissing of it all, I was just like, you know what, I'm done. But it made me turn off the channel. So even though they're your personal opinions, you're still affecting that channel. You do affect others. So let's watch the interview and see what happens. I take it that uh, Sterling's attitudes are not widely shared among the owners, but. How do you prevent that kind of ugliness um, from getting out? And how do you keep it out of the league? You don't. You don't? There's no law against stupid. You know? You know, I learned a long time ago, you can't, you know, talking, not from action, but you can't beat stupid, stupid out of people. You know, you can't talk stupid out of people. You can't expect stupid to disappear or dissipate. Um, you can try to help people who are, and that's typically what I try to do when I find it in my organizations. Um, but I also try not to be a hypocrite. Um, I know I'm prejudiced. I know I'm bigoted in a lot of different ways. You know, and I've said this before. If I see a black kid in a hoodie at night on the other side of the street, that's not, you know, I'm probably on the same side of the street. I'm probably going to walk to the other side of the street. If I see a white guy with a shaved head and lots of tattoos, I'm going back to the other side of the street, right? If I, if I see anybody that looks threatening, you know, proud chances are there's part of me that takes into account race and gender and age. You know, I'm prejudiced. But other than safety issues, I try to always catch my prejudices and recognize and be very self-aware that, you know, my stream of thought is never perfect and I've got to be careful. and. You know, to me, that's part of growing up, and that's part of, you know, it's, it's what I try to instill in my kids, that, you know, not, none of us have pure thoughts. We all live in glass houses, and that part of maturing is recognizing when you're having thoughts that probably aren't right, catching yourself, and, and going forward. Um, but not everybody does that. And whether you're an employee or an employer, you know, People are going to be stupid and make mistakes. And the thing that scares me about this whole thing is I don't want to be a hypocrite, and I think I might have to be. You know, and, the, and that, I, you know, being a hypocrite bothers me more than anything after my family, so it, it won't be fun. What Mark Cuban doesn't understand is that, or he's not aware of, is that he's already a hypocrite. For him to say that there's no law against stupid, true, there's not a law against it, but if anyone has saw him on Shark Tank or see any type of business deal, you're not going to hire anybody who's stupid. You're not going to because they are an investment. It's that simple. You don't want somebody acting a fool all the time, all right, no matter how much talent they have. And I'll put it like this. Even if it was one of your basketball players on TV, okay, if you hire one of those guys and all of a sudden they start acting stupid, and it's not because of their talent, but they start saying outlandish things, you'll probably find them, right? 
If they start going out and doing crimes and things of that nature, you're going to release them, right? When people act stupid, there are consequences. So for you to say that there's no law against stupid, it may not be a law, but there's an unwritten one. And you know as an owner, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, that you would never take the gamble on someone if they acted that way. And for this crowd to sit around and clap like seals, that's another thing I will get into later, okay? But for him to say, you know, well, this black kid with a hoodie, really? Are we going here again? Black kid with a hoodie, young black man with a hoodie on, obviously you're scared. That just tells me right then and there that you have been watching way too much TV, okay? But then to say, you know, white guy, shaved head, tattoos, that's like, that's more descriptive. More descriptive. So, okay, that's what you fear. That is not black kid with hoodie, random black kid with hoodie. That doesn't sit well with a lot of people, especially after what's happened as of late. I'll get into that later as well, okay? But to say that it's not, it's more of a, it's a safety issue, yes, you're scared. And your fear has turned into ignorance. And we will talk about that later as well because he speaks about it, okay? But for him to say that he would look like a hypocrite because he doesn't want to judge someone else because he doesn't want to judge John Sterling, you know, he doesn't want to do that because he's saying he doesn't want to vote him out, but it looks like he's going to have to. And it's not going to be much fun. Mark Cuban, you understand you are voting out a man who is discriminatory of a race that impacts not only your players, but a culture, a people, way of living because of the color of their skin. You're voting them out because it's the right thing to do, not because it's fun. A hypocrite in what way? Well, you know, it, I just sat here, sat here and said, I'm, you know, I'm a bigot. You know, I just didn't say it out loud. Let me um, create a kind of- Let me qualify that because someone's gonna take it as a media thing, right? I've always gotta be careful now. Um, <laughs> You know. Does somebody want to tell me what the hell is this crowd laughing at? What Mark Cuban just said was the truth. There was no delivery or punchline there. He's saying he has to watch what he says because the media will be they'll be out to get on. They're going to twist his words, run it into the ground, and make him and paint him into a different type of you know light. And he's absolutely correct. He is telling the truth. There's no joke there. And this you know what this reminds me of when Dave Chappelle le uh, left. Comedy Central. Now, for those who remember, you know, his interview about that, he was saying how, you know, he would be, you know, in his own funk, you know, he would try to work out jokes and he knew that a lot of them were race jokes and he knew that a lot of them couldn't be used and he felt as though they weren't even funny. They were just absolutely racist and he wouldn't use them. He knew they were wrong. And he said even when he would, you know, get into his own thing and start talking about it and he said people would just laugh hysterically and he would turn to them and be like, yo, that's not funny. You know, he was like, that's why I'm working on this, because it's not funny. It's just absolutely racist. And for you to laugh hysterically at something that's absolutely racist, then he said, you know, start pointing fingers at them and saying, now you're racist because you're laughing at it. See, that's what happened. And this seems like this is the same problem that we're, we're seeing right now. This is pretty much the same example where he's just telling the truth and people are laughing and people are clapping and it makes no sense and it makes them look bad. But you know what? Let's just keep moving on because, like I said, it's not a joking matter what he's talking. That's, that's really how it is. You know, I think we're all bigots, right? And I don't think there's any question about that. But I also think that um, I, I, I was raised, I, I remember when I was, one of my earliest memories, my father telling me, my, my uncle was the superintendent of the D.C. school districts in the 60s, all right? And um, I remember us sitting down and, and him being very clear to me that the way we think in this family is that everybody's equal, that if you go back and look at the history of people who have been oppressed, um, it's never been for a good reason and it's never valid and it's never acceptable. And of, any, of everything and anything you possibly can do, treating anybody differently for race, religion, or any other reason is wrong. Um, but that doesn't mean you're not gonna have those thoughts from time to time. Right, we all we all succumb to those thoughts, and you've got to realize that when you have those thoughts, they're wrong. And as you know, my point in saying all this is, I do. You know, like I said, I'll go to the other side of the street. Um, but to me, that makes me a hypocrite in some respects by trying to hold somebody else to a different standard. So, I'm sure, that'll be all over the place. But... And this is where Mark Cuban is wrong. Not everyone is a bigot. Children, when they start out, all right, do not know what racism is. 
with prejudice or bigotries. They don't know those things. They don't know how to react to that. So now we have a classic case of individual responsibility versus society and how it impacts another or influences another. That's what this comes down to, all right? Nobody is born racist or prejudiced or a bigot. Nobody, okay? It is all about your upbringing, your teaching, and how society has influenced you to act. That's the way it goes. Now, I will put it like this. For him to sit here and say that he will cross the street, that is fear. That is absolute fear, like I said before. But for him to say it makes him a hypocrite to judge another person, and everyone starts clapping once again, no, it doesn't make you a hypocrite because at that point, it is not about you. It's not. And you keep putting this on you. No, this isn't. No. This is about other people. And it's about making things better. It is holding somebody down, oppressing somebody. You think those Clippers players want to play for an owner that clearly feels that way about them? Do you think that way? I mean, seriously, after everything that's happened, do you think they want to? Blake Griffin came out not too long ago and said it is not ideal that we play for a man like that next season. That's all Blake Griffin said, you know, because he wants to keep it professional. He doesn't want to say, I'm going to walk off from the team. He doesn't want to say that, you know. None of them want to say that. But for you to sit here and say that it's because, you know, it's going to make you look like a hypocrite. No, it's not. No one's going to say you're a hypocrite because you're doing the right thing. They will say you're a hypocrite for, or an arrogant douche for thinking only about yourself in this situation. You cannot sit here and say that Donald Sterling's impact on what has happened. And the thing is, people tend to forget Donald Sterling isn't the first person to do this. He's not. Should we talk about the Houston Astros and Jim Crane? Should we talk like, and it's not just not about sports. People in general in everyday life do this. It is oppression at one point. It is stereotypes. It is prejudice. There is bigotry anywhere you go. Okay? So let's not act like this is the only issue or this is just, you know, a isolated incident. Let's not act that way. What Mark Cuban has to understand is that, like I said, it's not about him at this point. It is not when it happens every day out here. You have to set a bar. And that's what we're supposed to do as human beings, right? So that we can evolve, you're supposed to set a bar on what civilly that you will do. You know what I mean? How the world should act. That owners, people of power, will not have this happen. Like I said, it's not about you being a hypocrite. But it is about, apparently, you being arrogant, which it still comes down to. So, Mark, it was uh, all over the place. It was a media thing. Uh, but you really, you apologized for one portion of that, and that was uh, to Trayvon Martin's family, correct? Yeah, I, and the reason I apologize is because I've met and spent time with his family, and I, when I said it, I had to consider that they might have to deal with all the media onslaught, and that's not fair to them. I mean, I know his brother, I tried to hire his brother, he's a super smart kid, um, and he's going to do amazing things. And I did feel, I, I hadn't considered the Martins, and I felt bad for that. And so for that reason, you know, I owed them an apology. And let me be clear, no one asked me to apologize. I did it voluntarily because I'd made a mistake as far as the Martin family was concerned. Are you serious? Are we really going here? Really? Look, I put it like this. For him to come out and say, well, didn't nobody make me apologize? I came out and apologized myself. You don't get any points for that. You're supposed to. You want, like, there's some type of credit, like you're being this bigger person. No. And you're only apologizing to Trayvon Martin's family. The only reason you know them is because of what happened. But what you fail to realize, Mark Cuban, is that there are millions of other people that have been stereotyped and killed or arrested or brutally beat for the same thing. So they don't, you know, you don't owe them an apology because you don't know them, right? But because you know a high-profile case. Because that's what it was. Let's be honest here. Okay? Look, Mark Cuban... Understand that when you push a stereotype, because that's what you did, you committed it, you're, you admitted it yourself. There's prejudice. You, you've succumbed to the stereotype, okay? And then to say that that's the only people you're going to apologize to, it actually makes you look worse, okay? But like I said, if he wants to apologize, whatever. If he doesn't, whatever. At this point in the game, apology from this guy doesn't matter. I'm just pointing out all the things that make him flip-flop and contradict himself since he's so much of, you know, he doesn't want to be called a hypocrite, but he's making himself look like it more and more he speaks. It is a shame that this is what it's come to. There are way other people before Trayvon Martin that was, man, let's just move on. Seriously, y'all know what I'm getting at. 
Mark, when you sit down and look back to the interview, you say two things, being a bigot and being prejudicial. Do you I think to me there's a two, two totally different things. I think we, uh, so do you regret using the word bigot and just saying we no. all? No, what I, what I meant was, you know, the way I define them, Charles, is that, you know, you're, you're prejudiced when you have preconceived notions. You're bigoted when you take some sort of action. You're a racist when you take some sort of oppressive, oppressive or derogatory or, or impactful, negatively impactful action against a race or group of people. So because I was, I was bigoted because I was going across the street, that was an action as a, you know, and so that's the way I defined the three different words. Did you see Charles Barkley's face on when he said he wasn't going to take back those statements? Now he goes on to say about prejudice, bigotry, and racism, all right? Even though he kind of like caps it, you know, hard cap on it, there's many more factors to these things, okay? But we'll go by what he's saying, okay? I will put it like this. It is a very fine line between prejudice, bigotry, and racism. It's like steps one, two, and three. If you complete steps one and two, you're going to complete step three, okay? I will put it like this. When he said that he was afraid because it's for his safety concern, you automatically turn it prejudice because you are singling people out, right? Then you act on it, meaning, like he said, it's bigotry. So he crossed the street, all right? Then he says racism is, you know, more of oppressing those type of individuals. You do understand that you are oppressing a person of their individuality, right? You are showing that this is the reason why you're doing this. Steps one, two, and three. People have failed to realize that when you start running into stereotypes, because he says, young black male with a hoodie. Anybody remember before it was young black male with a hoodie? It was young black male wearing white tees and tin boots and baggy jeans. Before that, it was young black male wearing whatever with a bald head. You remember these things? Every time there is a style or a trend, the media, I'm not saying Mark Cuban, the media does this. And then they keep, you know, throwing out there and flooding it out there. And hopefully, you know, because it's like bait and hoping that the public catches that hook. We see it time and time again. Mark Cuban caught the hook. He was the big fish. So as you can see, I'm not going to call Mark Cuban racist, but he is damn near close to it. Because I don't see you, you know, crossing the street when you have your players on the court, you know, your players that are full of tattoos. You know, when you're hugging them and, and, and cheering with them, or is it because you're, you're in a big stadium or because there's security or is it because you employ them? It seems like there's something wrong here, whether they're wearing hoodies or tattoos or whatever the, the trend may be at the time. You are still looking out for that. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Uh, you know, I, I just probably have more of a commentary more than a kind of, This is the first time I actually saw it in its entirety. So I'm taking some kind of you know, mental notes and, and written notes. So it's more of a commentary and, and a question at the same time. Because I really just felt that, you know, I respect your comments uh, for sure. Uh, but for me, it sounds more uh, fearful and stereotypical than racist or bigotry. Meaning, like in my neighborhood or where I grew up, you know, having a hood or having tattoos wasn't fearful for me. I have other fears that I probably express in other ways. But those two things, when I saw people like that, didn't really make me fearful. So I, I understand, but I always felt that but, but, Sterling was different in the sense that his fears, which turned into ignorance, did turn into racism because it's been documented. Only because he's, he's, he's done the housing, he's, done, he's also mentioned that he wouldn't want them in the arena, African Americans. And then he had reverse racism when he told J.J. Reddick that he wouldn't he, he doesn't think a white guy is worth sure. that kind of money. Look, so to I, me, I wasn't trying to. Yes. I wasn't trying to compare it all to Donald Sterling at all. I mean, and remember, I said late at night with a hoodie. I don't care if somebody wears a hoodie. Golly, I mean, you know, I couldn't associate with anybody. I don't care if it's a black kid, an orange kid, a green kid, a brown kid. Wearing a hoodie is inconsequential. It means nothing. The bigger point, and again, it was a bad example, and it was it was a wrong example. Is if Kenny, I don't care who you are. If you're walking down the street late at night, and I've been in that circumstance, it's not just a hypothetical, I've been there, and you see some kid that you think is threatening in any way, shape, or form, you're going to the other side of the street. Thank you for backtracking, Mark Cuban, because you say, well, I didn't really mean, you know, black kid with hoodie, but that, that's what you said. That's what you said. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, okay? 
But then he goes on to say it could be anybody late at night with a hoodie and he would cross the street. Anybody would. No, you're absolutely wrong. And this is where the culture clash comes in because you're talking to a person like myself or Kenny Smith. And I want to thank Kenny Smith for saying that. OK, but this is why I jumped at the chance for interviewing Kenny Smith instead of Charles Barkley or Shaq or whatever, because he's the only voice of reason on that show. This is exactly why. All right. Mark Cuban, understand when you grow up in that and you're seeing tattoos and you're seeing people being killed and people walk around with hoodies. We get used to that. As sad as it is, we get used to it. All right. It doesn't scare us at all. So for you to say you see a guy late at night wearing a hoodie, guess what? Then you should try going down North Philly late at night where you see a bunch of guys hanging on the block, five, six at a time, with hoodies on. Will you cross the street then? I guarantee you if you see that and you start crossing the street, they're going to notice. See, this is the difference between some guy, like I said, who's rich and is pretty much detached from society as opposed to other people in the real world. All right? This is why it doesn't affect a lot of us and it, why it comes off as absolutely stupid to what he is saying. And here's the thing. He talks about how it was a bad example. He shouldn't have said that. Remember? He said that. But he's not going to apologize for it. So he's admitting that he's wrong on what he said, but he's not going to apologize, but only to the Trayvon Martin family. Period. End of story. And I don't care what they're wearing. And I chose Hoodie as an example. It was a poor example, but it was just an example. And as you heard in the tape, I went on to say other stereotypes, whatever they may be. It was just bad example. Right, and I, that was my point. Carry, but I, I just felt that carrying the stereotype or the or the uh, or, or the look of someone, and then carrying it to the point where you act on it in terms of a negative yeah. way, in terms of you hold people back in different ways, that's prejudice, and that's why I was trying to think what Charles was well, saying. Well, that's actually racism. That's, that's, that's racism, racism, right? Now. That's racism. But being that's prejudiced, racism. I'm prejudiced against people who didn't go to University of North Carolina. I'm prejudiced against <laughs> people from New York City. That's not from New York City, but that doesn't, I won't hold that accountable as a criteria right. for you being next to me, with me, or about me. But if you are, exactly. I, sometimes I like it. Look, Mark Cuban said, you know, we, we did use other stereotypes. Yes, you did. That doesn't negate the fact of what you did. All right, you're trying to pass up. No, I, I used other stereotypes. Yeah, but you were so much more descriptive about it. All right, you were. However, we will put it like this. I know a lot of people won't see this as racist, you know, with him. And... I don't think he's, like I said, I don't want to say he's racist, but people have to understand when people are looking for the race card, they're undermining the other two factors that he is prejudiced and that he is a bigot. Once you act on it, that's damn, that's like crossing right over, one foot over the line of racism. That's the problem. It's as bad as an old lady seeing a black person and clutching her purse. As people, we're supposed to, even if you have those type of thoughts, you're not supposed to act on it. That's how you become better people. That's how you evolve. He is not learning from it. So regardless of what he's saying, whether it's last week or this week, he's not growing. This is who he is. That's the problem. He's not working on it. And it's sad to see that. But I guess it is what it is. Like I said, I'll put it like this. I appreciate Mark Cuban's honesty in all of this. I appreciate it. I don't, however, respect his opinions. Now I want to move on. We'll talk more NBA. Like I said, NBA is rigged. We saw it last week, and now we're seeing it this week. Don't sit here and tell me, all right, OKC versus San Antonio. Do not tell me that you can sit down Serge Ibaka for the season because his injury is so bad, is so bad, that he cannot play. He is done for the season, okay? And then three games later, he miraculously makes a comeback and has a great game in the playoffs. It is such a bad thing to see that even Greg Popovich, when he lost, even took a shot at it. Who uh, went to the locker yes. room? Money went to the locker room late in the fourth quarter. Is he is he good or physically okay? He'll be he'll be fine. Okay. Or he's out for the rest of the playoffs. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you were shut down for the season. Guess what? You're done. Don't tell me that you're just going to come back three games later. That makes absolutely no sense. And a lot of people have been saying, test him for something. Either he's hopped up on something or he really wasn't hurt. And this is the NBA just trying to pull a dramatic act. Either way, it doesn't look right for basketball. Okay? And I want to move on to another one. All right? Paul George. That's right. For those who don't know, Paul George is upset about playing the Miami Heat in game four. And he accuses the refs, that's right, of giving them the win them shooting twice as many free throws 
is more to do with them being more aggressive going in the paint or a little bit of home court advantage? What do you think? I mean, you, you can't tell me we don't attack the basket as much as they attack the basket. You know, you can't tell me we're not aggressive. Uh, maybe we're too aggressive. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I feel like we're, we're just as aggressive, just, just as aggressive as they are attacking the basket and, you know, uh, making plays at the rim. Uh, you know, maybe this was just home cooking. Paul George is the last person to say anything as far as I'm concerned. I have never in all my years played basketball, and I'm telling you, I've tried to dunk on people, get flipped up, land them on my head. I have been all types of injured. I have never once out of all my injuries or other people seeing injured on a basketball court, on a concrete court, or on the wood and hardwood, never. And then we're talking elbows, the face, and mouth, everything. Never have a concussion. And you can tell me you won't have a concussion, and then X amount of days later, you're clear to play basketball. That never happens. People who know others who have concussions, you are not cleared three, four days later to play basketball or any type of physical activity of that nature. You know and I know it. There is no way. But apparently, this is once again, like I said, either he was acting or, or there's something up. All right? Either way, it makes the NBA look bad. I don't want to hear anything that Paul George has to say. As far as I'm concerned, saying you have a concussion and then coming back a couple days later, oh, I'm absolutely fine now, is a joke. You know that. I know that. There's no defending this stuff, man. If this is what the NBA has to do to pull dramatics and try to get, you know, people to watch more, then it should tell you something about their product. And it's a problem. I want to move on. Still in the basketball, but also football. For those who don't know, Connor Barwin, that's right, from the Philadelphia Eagles, is a big time basketball fan and for those who do not know what I'm talking about when I mean big time basketball fan even the Eagles themselves have their own basketball team that picture you're seeing is the Philadelphia Eagles basketball team for a charity uh, was it that happened in March I didn't know it was going on in 2014 uh, but the game was played in Harrisburg which I'm trying to figure out why it wasn't here in Philadelphia however that team can be beat I'm saying it now it can be beat by the street ballers around here all right that's, you have to understand, when we play basketball around here, man, like that's the type of challenge you're looking for. Let these mountains come out here and watch them climb these mountains. You know what I mean? Like that's that's how we do things. I will say this, though. You have to understand that Connor Barwin is a big basketball fan. He spends his time on the offseason doing youth fitness exercises and fitness programs and trying to help the youth in their activities. At this point, I want to say thank you to Connor Barwin because he's always around here. Literally, he is at like a 20th Street, always riding his bike from practice all the way here. I will, I'm going to try to see if I can get an interview with Connor Barwin to see how he feels about you know the basketball community around here and see you know if we can get something together you know to help the community. Maybe if you know I can I'll try to reach out to him on Twitter probably after the video and see what's going on. But it just goes to show you that there are athletes that do want to help. And it's a, it's a shame because when you guys sent me this on Twitter, it's a shame that we don't get more press about this. Like, I haven't seen this on CSN. I haven't seen this anywhere, like, on a media outlet. You know, it, it took one of you guys to send me a link. That's what it took. You know? So without you guys, I wouldn't have known. But now that I know, like I said, I'm going to try and reach out to him and see, you know, see if we can get something going. So, anyways, I'm done for today. It was kind of, like I said, I really didn't want to talk about the Mark Cuban thing, but it needed to be done. Once one of those things. I think Mark Cuban can learn something from that. You don't want to vote Donald Sterling out, but it needs to be done. It's not about you. When I did this today, it wasn't about me. You know? It needed to be done. Because it seems like, you know, I, I really felt that that TNT interview was not conducted better. And I feel for these guys to be professionals. Kenny Smith is the only person that's, you know, stepped up and said something. But for these guys to be professionals and these guys to have as much fan base as they do and, and be so influential, they constantly drop the ball.